Merci. It's a great honor to be here. I, I sort of feel like I'm a sheep being brought into the lion's den. You probably don't expect uh, someone from Yale University to be uh, very helpful on this topic of climate change. Uh, there you go. So uh, maybe I can surprise you, maybe not. Um, what I wanted to talk about today is, was trying to come up with the social cost of carbon. Let's see, this is not going to work. OK. Whoop. Come up with the social cost of carbon. So why would, do we want a social cost of carbon? What is it? That's what we're going to try to talk about first. And it turns out the social cost of carbon is trying to tell you what the price of carbon should be. So one of the things that we believe in, that this group seems to believe in, is that we believe in markets. Markets are very powerful tools. And one of the things that, that makes markets work is that we have prices for things. And once we have prices for things, it turns out the people that produce know exactly how much to produce. So why do we want a social cost of carbon? We want to get the price of carbon right. And if we got the price of carbon right, then it turns out that everybody in the fossil fuel business will know exactly what they're supposed to do after that. They'll figure out exactly what's the most efficient things to be doing in terms of abatement of costs, in terms of picking out which fossil fuels you want to burn, when you want to burn them. So it turns out we want this price. This price is really important for the marketplace so it can figure out what to do about this problem. If you don't pick a social cost of carbon, then you're going to pick regulations. You're going to end up with individual rules that say you must do this, you must do that. And one of the things that I think we all recognize is that when the government gets in, in this business, there's lots of things the government's about doing with that, and we're not going to like that from a market perspective, and it's not going to be very efficient. So we want to have a social cost of carbon because it is the price of carbon. And if you know the price of carbon, it turns out that if you're in the business of producing energy, you'll actually know where to go in the future and what to do. So what is it? It's trying to measure what's the actual damage of adding one more ton of carbon into the atmosphere. That's exactly what it's trying to do. So when it, you actually can calculate that, then it turns out um, you know how much you ought to spend to avoid it. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to figure out, you put a ton of carbon in the atmosphere, it turns out it's going to stick around there for a long time. That's one thing the science is pretty clear about. And as it sits around there, it's going to contribute to climate change. How much it contributes to climate change, that's a climate science question. But the, what I'm assuming is that the scientists have some idea what they're talking about and that, that it's going to result in a small change in climate. And what we're going to do is follow that change in climate over time. We're going to see all the things it's going to do into the future. And then we're going to take the present value of it back. So we're going to discount it back using the interest rate to try to figure out what is it worth today. So that's what we're trying to do with this social cost of carbon. What is it actually, where, where is this social cost of carbon, what is it measuring? It's measuring impacts across the world. So one of the things that's pretty clear, you warm up the, the, the uh, you put CO2 in the atmosphere, you don't just warm up the United States, you don't just warm up the place around the power plant. This is a global issue, you warm up the whole planet. So when you're measuring this, it turns out you're measuring impacts across the world. And that's important to understand because the bulk of the damages from climate change are not going to be felt in the rich world. The bulk of the damages are going to be happening closer to the equator, which means that it's the poor two-thirds of the world. They're the ones that are going to feel most of the damages. And when you calculate the social cost of carbon, you might say, well, how much of that is U.S. impacts? Well, it turns out the U.S. is not particularly vulnerable to warming in the near term. The kind of warming we're going to see in the near term is going to affect the southern tier of the United States, but not most of the country. Most of the country might actually benefit from this. So the share of the U.S. in global damage is quite small. And that's important to understand. When people are saying this is the price of carbon, they're not saying this is the damage to the United States. What they're saying is this is the damage to the world. Now, if everybody in the world contributes to the cost of this, the U.S. will only be paying its fair share. But it's, this is not U.S. damages. This is global damages. So what are these damages? What happens? So if but the planet warms, it turns out a small part of the world economy is vulnerable. And most of the world economy that's vulnerable is the part that deals with the outside, that involves interactions with the environment. So the agriculture is one of the things we're worried about. We, we know that sea level rise is occurring. 
The idea is that warming in the planet is going to increase that a little bit more. That, that's going to result in coastal inundation. That's going to be an issue. If it gets warmer, it turns out that there are going to be increasing costs to try to keep the planet cool, to keep indoors cool. On the other hand, you won't have to spend as much money keeping yourself warm. Um, we know that there's going to be some issues with water. Water is probably going to become more scarce, more valuable, and so that that's going to cause a damage. And then finally, there's going to be a change to ecosystems that will directly affect how, tr how fast trees will grow. Our current best estimate is that trees will grow faster in this warmer world. So that's actually likely to be a benefit, not actually a damage. And then there's going to be, that's things to the economy. So a little, it's 5% of the economy that is potentially vulnerable to, to this, but potentially important parts of the economy. And then there's, there's non-market things we're worried about. There could be some effects on health. Diseases can actually spread into places where they don't exist right now. That could cause trouble. We'll have more opportunities to have heat stress. And then there's going to be some changes in ozone. Ozone will form more rapidly. So there's going to be some health effects that are associated with this. And finally, the most dramatic thing that's going to happen if we warm the planet is ecosystems are going to change. Now, that's a scientific fact that they're going to change. What kind of damages we associate with that, that's not so clear. Uh, that, that part has not been established very, very um, carefully. So these are the things we're worried about. They're going to cause the, the, the effects we're, we're going to generate. And it's going to happen over time. So if you look at one particular model, and it throws in a ton of carbon dioxide today, it turns out it takes 20 or 30 years before that carbon dioxide, that ton, actually does very much. And that's because there's huge lags in this system. It turns out you don't warm the planet by warming the atmosphere. You warm the planet by warming the oceans. And the oceans are vast. So it takes a long time to warm the oceans. And so everything you do in terms of this greenhouse gas problem, it turns out they all have long lags. There's a big gap between taking an action and the consequence with this particular problem. It's not like sulfur dioxide. You put it up in the atmosphere, you get affected right away. You see exactly what you're up against. You stop putting SO2 up in the atmosphere, it goes away, it's gone. This is a problem, you put it in the atmosphere, it takes forever for anything to happen, and, and then it's going to happen, it's gonna last forever. It's gonna last for centuries. So that's important to understand that this, the consequences of this is a stream that happens way out into the future. Why do we want a price on carbon? If we can get a price on carbon that's uniform across the entire planet, we can at attack this problem cost effectively. That is, you set the price, it's the same price everywhere in the planet. Every single polluter in the planet should equate their marginal cost curve to this price. You make a perfectly efficient system. That's the ideal system. If you don't do this tax, this price on carbon, your next best thing is you get individual regulators in each state, in each country, uh, in each place, setting different rules for different people. They're not going to equate marginal cost. It's going to be really expensive. Whatever they do, they're going to often be at cross purposes. Uh, they're going to spend a lot of money on stuff that has no effect, which is what we're doing today. And you're going to, get, um, you're going to be spending a vast amount of money and getting nothing for it. So one of the things that's very obvious, if you're going to do anything about this, you want to be very careful that you do it wisely. And setting a common price is going to give you that. So the idea is you want to have this common price. What, what that price should be, we're going to talk about. But we want this common price. It's a very important to get this as an effective tool to do what we're trying to do in this case. So how is, how is this price going to affect the fossil fuel industry? Well, the fossil fuel industry is, where, is the source of a great deal of the greenhouse gases that we're worried about. So it is going to affect the fossil fuel industry. That's exactly why you have these rules. But the question is, how? If the social cost of carbon is less than $100, you're still going to have a fossil fuel industry. That is not a high enough price to eliminate it. What you're going to try to do is try to move from high carbon to lower carbon fuels. That's what, that's what this tax is going to try to get you to do. And that's effectively what's going to happen to the industry. But if prices get higher than that, if you start approaching over $100, it turns out that you will then start to buy abatement devices, which will actually capture carbon as it leaves a fossil fuel plant. And then you'll try to be capturing that carbon and storing it underneath. So at higher prices, 
it turns out you still want to have a fossil fuel industry, but it turns out you'll have abatement technology at that point that's actually going to control the amount of emissions. And it turns out if you get a very high price, as you start getting up into two or three hundred dollars, that's when you're going to actually leave your fossil fuels in the ground. So it's not that the social cost of carbon is the death knell of fossil fuels. It very much depends on the prices you're actually setting it at. So what are you going to do with these prices? It turns out the optimal set of prices start low and gradually get tighter as this problem gets worse. So if, as the planet gets warmer and warmer, the marginal damage of another ton is going to get more and more severe. And you're going to want to have those prices rise in concert with the amount of damage that's being done. Now, having said that, there's this perfect carbon price. The devil's in the details. When I was a college kid, the, uh, I remember that we had the Corps of Engineers who were going around building all these gigantic dams, and, and it turns out a lot of those dams should never have been built. Huge cost, low benefits. Wow, Congress finally said, we're going to do cost-benefit analysis. That's going to get rid of all these dams. Okay, so in some sense, you set the carbon price right. It's going to manage this problem correctly, as, as efficiently as you can. You're done. But will we get the carbon price right? So my personal feeling is that this particular effort by the Obama administration did not get the carbon price right. Uh, in fact, one of the things that's interesting about this particular interagency task force is they couldn't make up their mind what the carbon price was supposed to be. Originally it was $21, but they said, nah, that's not high enough. They came back later and said, oh, suddenly it's $24. Uh, that wasn't high enough. They came back and now it's $36. What happened between the $21 and the $36? Did we suddenly discover that climate change was different than we thought it was? There was no new information. This was a political decision to try to get a carbon price that was basically part of the war on coal. So my personal opinion is this particular attempt to get at the social cost of carbon uh, failed. And it failed because um, the, the people that were in charge of it tried to get a very high carbon price that is not justified by the science. So they tried to get this $36. One of the, the assumptions they made to get that number is they assumed there would never be any mitigation. That is, they're setting a price to great, create mitigation based on the idea there wouldn't be any mitigation. And what, what happens if that's true? It means nobody on the planet was going to mitigate, not just this year, not next year, not ever. And if you do that, it turns out you end up with no abatement. You end up with vast amounts of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. You end up with huge future damages. And they set that on the assumption that there was no abatement. But you don't want to set rules like, you don't want to set prices on the basis that you don't have the good. You don't want to set the price of water on the idea that you don't get water. Because if you set the price of water and since I'm only going to give you one liter, what would you pay for it? Well, you need two liters a day to survive. You're going to pay a lot for that first liter. That liter is, that's death or life for you. But you don't, that's not going to be the price of water. The actual price of water is like a penny for 10 gallons. So you, you wouldn't want to set it at a price as if water was incredibly scarce. You want to set it where the price is going to lead to a certain supply, and you want to know what the demand is at that supply. And so if you set the price so that you're actually going to get the mitigation that that price would cause, it turns out you would set a much lower price than what the, what the government recommended. So this is one of the places where they made a huge mistake. What else did they make a huge mistake about? They said, well, you know, the world is uncertain. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. So let's assume some of the worst things that could happen. Let's look at what those outcomes might be. And by looking at those outcomes and, and assuming there was never going to be any mitigation, well, it turns out the worst possible thing that can happen is pretty bad. All we have to do is use our imaginations so we can think of some pretty awful things. That was part of the other reason why the price is really, really high. And then the third thing that was wrong is it turns out they weren't thinking that we are going to adapt. They're assuming that climate was going to change not over 10 years, not over 50 years, but over 100 or 200 years, and we would do nothing to adapt. And that turns out to be a huge mistake because we are going to change 
if we find ourselves in a warmer world. It's pretty obvious. You take somebody from Maine and you put them down in Florida, if they behave like they're still in Maine, they're going to be in trouble. It isn't going to work. So one of the things that has to happen is you have to recognize we will all adapt. And we're going to adapt not because we want to save the planet, because we want to save ourselves. It's in our own interest to adapt as individuals, as firms, as communities, as local governments. We all have a reason to adapt. And as we adapt, the damages that will actually occur are going to be much less than what would happen if we did not adapt. And in this particular case, I'm guessing the difference between no adaptation, which is what the, most of the models assumed, and adapting is vast. And if you actually look at the damage that's caused if we adapt, it's much smaller than what the, this particular panel thought it would be. And so it turns out that the problem of climate change is not as catastrophic as many of my colleagues believe it to be. It turns out that we can, in fact, adapt to a warmer world. We can live in a warmer world. What we need to think about is just how far we want to go. How much warmer a world do we want to tolerate? And it turns out that in practice, if we set prices like $5 a ton today, which is not going to affect our economic growth at all, if we set the prices at that price, we can keep the planet from warming dramatically, and we can stay away from the most ridiculous amounts of, of warming that are possible, and we can keep the planet safe. So my personal plea is that actually we have a place to go with climate change. It's a moderate place where we do moderate things today to get rid of carbon dioxide cheaply, and that we avoid the worst possible things that can happen, and that that is the world that we have at our fingertips. If I had to give advice to President Trump, it would be seize this moment, adopt some moderate policies, get the world on the right path, seize this, this issue, and take it away from the climate extremists. Thank you.